Good evening and welcome. My name is Jeanette Sanger and I'm a trustee of this wonderful library where I wish we could all be together for this fascinating program. Our library just celebrated its 267th an anniversary and has valiantly carried on during this terrible pandemic. Please know that your contributions are needed now more than ever. And we so appreciate the generosity of our patrons. I am thrilled that we are celebrating a book about my favorite artist, Romer Bearden. I knew him through my bookstore, Books and Company, where he came every Saturday morning with his pals, including Al Murray and a man named Jack Fine, a dentist, who was, and to look at books and to chat. He was always dressed in his dark blue coveralls and always had a wonderful smile. We were proud to host a show of his watercolors at New York City that were used during the opening credits of Gloria, the movie. I was interested to learn that Romero started out as a cartoonist, but later turned to painting collages and other art forms. An American Odyssey, The Life and Work of Romero Bearden by Mary Schmidt Campbell has received rave reviews everywhere. All the reviews comment on the meticulous research and captivating language. The book explores the political history of African Americans, as well as American history, art, and culture in general. Dr. Campbell was a major force in the cultural life of New York City before becoming the 10th president of Spelman College. She transformed the Studio Museum in Harlem and championed the need for professional development opportunities for women and people of color in the arts. She has had such a distinguished career and has received so many awards, I could spend our whole time speaking about it, but I know we would much rather listen to Dr. Campbell herself. Dr. Campbell will be speaking with Sherman Edmiston, president of Essie Green Gallery, and one of the most respected dealers of black masterworks in the country. Included in our program tonight will be June Kelly, who managed Romare Bearden's career for 13 years until his death in 1988. The June Kelly Gallery was founded in 1987 and specializes in contemporary artists, sculptors, and photographers. And now, let us welcome Dr. Campbell. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here at the New York Society Library. Uh, and I'm delighted that I'll be in conversation in a few minutes with Sherman Edmondson and June Kelly, my old friend, June Kelly, I should say. Uh, so what I'd like to do this evening is begin by giving a brief overview of the life and work of Romery Bearden, and, and particularly focusing on a topic that when I was uh, training as an art historian was taboo, and that's the topic of race and the topic that race, the role that race plays in the development of an artist's life and in, in the development of an artist's work. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's get started, Sarah, on the slides. Thank you. Next slide. The slide you're, you're, you're seeing now is the cover of Bearden's retrospective exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1971. And I like to begin with this slide because that exhibition was the first solo show of an African-American artist at MoMA uh, since 1937. Bearden had a show at that time and the sculptor Richard Hunt also opened with a show at the same time in 1971. And I show that because it wasn't until 1971 that African-American artists were recognized by the, um, I would say, the standard bearer for modernism as being part of the American canon. Next slide. 
Whenever I tell somebody that I, I've written a biography of Romy Beard, and I get two questions. The first question is why? And the second question very often is, well, who is Romy Bearden? And I very often refer to a quote by August Wilson, the great African-American playwright who wrote a 10 play cycle on black life. Uh, and I quote what he said when he first looked at that catalog from MoMA. And I quote, what I saw was black life presented on its own terms with all its richness and fullness in a language made attendant to everyday life, ennobled it, affirmed its value, and exalted its presence. Next slide. And there are many uh, uh, collages of the works of Rome Reed Bearden that illustrate the words of August Wilson. Um, this slide, for example, Sheba, of a woman sitting is turned into an image of a regal monarch where Bearden has brought together abstract elements of color and light and composition to, to transform a simple act of everyday life into an act of nobility. Next slide. He uses light in color with a, a kind of lushness and sensuousness that makes you feel as though you are totally immersed inside of his world. And you can understand what uh, Wilson is saying when he says that he, he takes black subject matter and he transforms it into something rich and wonderful and lush. Next slide. But if we're really honest about Romery Bearden's work, we have to notice also that there's something gritty something sometimes transgressive in the realism that uh, in his compositions. Uh, there are narratives that seem not only to, to present uh, cu uh, culture, to present race, but also to critique it, to critique race, gender, social class, and, and status, even as it ce is celebrated enduring cultural traditions. Next slide. I wanted to capture that balance that Bearden strikes between celebrating African-American culture and critiquing the culture of that African-American culture that incubates African-American culture. But I also wrote this book literally to try to piece together the pieces that made up Bearden's life. And the slide that you're looking at now shows Bearden himself at work in his studio. But I want you to concentrate on the photograph behind him. It's the photograph of his great grandparents, Henry and Rosa Kennedy. He was born in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1911 in the home of Henry and Rosa. They are his great grandparents and they were born into slavery. They were born into slavery and they managed during reconstruction to slip through that window that of, of, of liberation during reconstruction and actually build a prosperous life for themselves. They were homeowners, landowners, they had their own business, and Bearden was born into this, this uh, family that uh, descended directly from slavery. Next slide. <clears throat> Bearden's immediate family continued this, this uh, prosperity, continued this lineage. The photograph you're looking at now is a photograph of Bearden as a young boy with his uh, mop of hair standing between his great grandparents, Henry and Rosa. And directly behind him are his parents, Bessie Bearden and Howard Bearden, who are the children of uh, Rosa Kennedy, uh, Rose, I'm sorry, Rosa Bearden, who, that's Catherine, Be excuse me, Catherine Bearden, who is standing to the left of Mr. Bearden. And so this is, Bearden grew up in a lineage, great grandparents, grandparent, parents. So he was surrounded in this tightly knit uh, family. And this, this photograph was taken shortly after his family actually left North Carolina in the wake of a rising Jim Crow and had moved up north to Harlem. And they moved up north to Harlem at a very auspicious time. 
Next slide. They moved, up, they moved to Harlem at a time when his mother, Bessie Bearden, um, was able to rise to real fame in Harlem. She was uh, active in politics. You had, it's very interesting to remember that at about this time, most Black people were Republicans. But Bessie Bearden was part of a new wave of African-Americans who uh, joined the Democratic Party and in fact, were responsible for helping FDR win his first election. She was also a deputy tax collector. She was a journalist for the Chicago Defender. She was um, active socialite. And most importantly, in her home, she had a salon of all the leading intellectuals and artists of her day. Next slide. Um, and it was quite a wonderful time to be in Harlem. It was a time when Harlem was, was beginning to understand the power of mass movements. This is a, a photograph from 1917 of the Silent Parade. 10,000 African-Americans organized to protest Jim Crow laws and to protest Wilson's entry into World War I when we had not yet won democracy back here at home. So in fact, Bearden's family came to Harlem at a time that was incredibly fertile and incredibly generative. Next slide. People like Marcus Garvey were also organizing African-Americans to consider leaving the country and going back to Africa. He was a dynamic political uh, and, sip and social figure, and he was a guest in the Bearden home. Next slide. There were cultural leaders that would come to the Bearden home, like the painter Aaron Douglas, who was to, who was to be a mentor and coach and, and counselor to young Romy. Next slide. Throughout Harlem, there were artists like Augusta Savage, who had trained at Cooper Union and then uh, trained in Paris and had an art garage that was available to young painters like Romy Bearden and Norman Lewis and Jake Lawrence. Next slide. And then there were Bearden's peers like Jacob Lawrence who were incredibly talented. By the time Bearden started working as an artist in, 19, in the 1930s, it, were, it was the depression years, it was the years during the WPA, and he found himself surrounded by other African-American artists supported by the WPA. He never was. Um, and so he had a real community of an older generation as well as a younger generation where art and culture flourished. Next slide. It's no surprise then that when Bearden started out as, a, as an artist, and he started out as a cartoonist, as uh, Janet mentioned, um, and he started cartooning actually when he was in college. He started out at Lincoln University and then he transferred to Boston University. And then finally he graduated from NYU. But at each of those three schools, he practiced the, uh, the art of cartooning. And while he was still a college student, he was started publishing in Crisis Magazine, the magazine of the NAACP. And he began immediately to take up political topics. Um, he is protesting here the fact that uh, the New Deal was helping um, many people in the community, but not necessarily African-American workers. Next slide. After he graduated from college, Bearden got a job. And, and what is interesting about him as an artist is that he kept that job for over 30 years. He became a caseworker for the... Uh, um, uh, to uh, and helped out in the social services in New York City. Um, his first caseload uh, was uh, Harlem, and he would um, he was assigned tenements in Harlem. So he had a nine to five job, and he would come home at the end of the day, and that's when he would do his cartooning and his artwork. And he did not bite his tongue, as you can see. He portrays here um, the Ku Klux Klan with a swastika on the arm making the equivalency between the terrorism, domestic terrorism of the Ku Klux Klan and the rise of fascism. 
We have a cartoon for the Baltimore Afro, Afro, Afro-American, for the most part, and some other uh, publications for about three years. And then he became restless with cartooning and turned his attention to painting. Next slide. So late in the 1930s and into the 1940s, he began to paint and he painted in what, what I would uh, characterize as a social realist style. That was a style that was widely popular during the WPA. And he really focused on the conditions of African-American families, especially. And he treated those conditions in the South and in the North. And by 1942, he had a small body of work, which he uh, presented in his first solo show. And he, he really established himself then and there before, before he enlisted in the army as a bona fide artist. His mother, who was very much the socialized, didn't like that so much. She wanted him to be a doctor, but the dog was cast. He had decided to be an artist. Bearden did enlist in the army in 1942. Um, he goes in and there he makes a radical change in his art. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm leaving out a whole chapter. Next slide. Yes, next slide. So um, before we take him to the army, I want to also mention that Bearden had all these wonderful uh, peers and influences around him during the day. But at night, he had the world of Harlem Cabaret completely open to him. And I love to show this slide because it's a um, cartoon of all the nightclubs and juke joints and underground places that were part of Harlem nightlife that were so popular that people came from all over the world to Harlem. People came from all over New York City to Harlem. And Harlem was like a cultural demilitarized zone. It's where black people, white people, rich people, poor people could come together around this rather innovative uh, pioneering music called jazz. Next slide. Um, and it was a transgressive uh, environment. This is Gladys Bentley, a male impersonator who according to Bearden uh, was very famous for her very naughty songs that she would sing uh, and also very, very popular and very funny. Next slide. Of course, there were the Corrines who, who um, danced uh, in a very liberated fashion. This is Cab Calloway, one of the great band leaders and musicians of the era. Next slide. Uh, and then of course there was Josephine Baker who uh, left her position as a Corrine in Harlem and became the toast of the town in Paris. Next slide. And had a, an enormous influence on the artists, choreographers, musicians of, of uh, the Parisian world. Um, this is a cutout by Matisse. And we know for sure now, because we have some documentation and correspondence that Matisse actually uh, not only would have seen uh, Josephine Baker in Paris, but he also would come to New York and haunt the streets of Harlem as well. So Harlem, so Bearden, I say all that to say that Bearden grew up in this place that by day had this very rich civic, political, cultural life, and by night had this really innovative and disruptive um, forward-thinking uh, artistry that surrounded him. So um, even without being totally conscious of how important this was, all of that seeped into him and would find its way to his art fully formed by the time he was a mature artist. Next slide. Okay, so in, in 1942, he goes into the army and he gives up completely the idea that as an African-American artist, he had to portray African-American subject matter. That was what he believed around 1935, 1934, 1935. He even wrote an essay about it that uh, talked about the Negro um, <clears throat> artist in mo modern art and said that a Negro artist should have black subject matter and that's what he should, should paint. But as he, as he matured as an artist, he thought, no, as an artist, I should have the liberty to paint anything I want to paint. 
And I'm going to choose to paint the great themes um, in literature that uh, really make universal statements. And so he began with the um, Passion of Christ, which was exhibited in a, an avant-garde gallery in Washington, DC, and was seen by um, an avant-garde uh, dealer, Samuel Coots in New York, and Bearden was invited to become part of the, Go the Coots uh, stable of artists. Uh, those artists, many of those artists went on to become abstract expressionists and Bearden showed with them uh, for about three years between 40, 1945 and 1948. And then Coots made a very uh, sharp decision. He decided, I'm only going to show those artists who look as though they're painting in this large form, uh, in this expressionistic way. And he felt that Bearden's work was too reminiscent of Cubism. And then you can see um, the Cubist influences in Bearden's work of the 1940s. So Coots dropped Bearden. And this is after World War II. The community of artists in Harlem had kind of dissipated. So Harlem was no longer the uh, vital cultural community it had been before World War II. Bearden no longer had a New York gallery. So he did what any artist would do um, to try to find an artistic community. He spent time in Paris. Next slide. Uh, because Bearden had been in the army, he had access to the GI Bill. So he enrolled at the Sorbonne in a PhD program. And he says he probably went to class two or three times. Um, and for the most part, he got his education in Paris at the cafes, in the cabarets and on the streets of Paris with other uh, artists and musicians uh, whom he met there. And he met many. He was in the studio of Picasso and Brancusi and Leger. And one day he was sitting at a cafe and Matisse entered and everybody stood. And he was just so overwhelmed by how uh, artists were treated with such uh, respect uh, in Paris. And he completely fell in love uh, with the city. Uh, when his uh, GI Bill ran out, he had to go back to New York City and back to work as a social worker. And he really had trouble um, painting when he went back. And now what I thought was quite wonderful is that we opened up this session with Sea Breeze by Billy Eckstein. Bearden started to um, uh, write songs and Sea Breeze was one of the songs that he wrote. And he had some modest success as a, um, as a songwriter. Next slide. He also tried to reorganize some of the artists. He, when he returned, he had, a, he had a studio in the Apollo Theater, the great Apollo Theater, where all the great um, musicians would come to perform. And his studio was above the theater. And there were many other artists and he tried to organize, this is from the 1954 photograph by Sam Shaw. He tried to organize um, some of these artists to kind of recreate the energy of that uh, community that he had um, in Harlem during the 1930s and 40s. Um, and he did to some extent, but he just couldn't capture it. And, and after a while, he had a breakdown. Um, he married, uh, the woman he married was extraordinary. Her name was Nanette Rohan and she helped nurse him back to good health. He was living with his father um, at the time that he had the breakdown. She convinced him to move out into his own studio. Next slide. Um, and she, this is, uh, this is just an example of some of the work that he did when he had that, uh, was trying to organize artists and, and paint, uh, uh, from uh, a live model. Next slide. But it was Nanette who, um, helped him really <coughs> find a new artistic voice. And in fact, helped him get his first solo show. Um, since he had been, uh, since he had left the Coots Gallery. And the works that Bearden painted from about the mid 1950s <clears throat> to the 1960s are these large 
non-objective oils. And they look like ab abstract expressionist paintings. And they're quite beautiful. There was a show recently at the Newburger of a collection of these. And it's quite an extraordinary body of work. And if he had stopped there, he would have been recognized as a very important American artist, perhaps not a great one, but a very important one. Next slide. But of course, um, he did not stay with that style. And in the 1960s, as the civil rights movement began to gain steam, in 1963, uh, the March on Washington took place and Bearden and a group of artists decided to go to the march. <clears throat> they also, this group, formed a collective called Spiral. Uh, this was a group of artists, most of whom uh, Bearden knew back from the 1940s, Norman Lewis, Charles Alston, Hale Woodruff, uh, some younger artists like uh, Richard Mayhew and others. Uh, Emma Amos was the only, the late Emma Amos was the only woman uh, who was invited to join. And as the artists got together, they began to discuss what it meant to be a Black artist during the civil rights movement. And Bearden wanted the artists to do something together, to do a collaborative project. And he suggested that maybe they could do collage. And he would bring to the spiral meetings these paper bags full of scraps and pictures and things he had cut out from Nanette's uh, fashion magazines. And he tried to get them to work on a group collage and nobody was interested. So he took them back and he began to do what, what were really small pieces. They were about the size of, you know, uh, printer paper. They were literally about this size. That uh, that image, right, that you're you're uh, that's on your screen right now. And he would put the pieces together and create these absolutely dynamic images that have this kind of "you are there" feel to them. And one day when he was working on him, one of his, his, his friends from Spyro came in and said, you know what you ought to do with that? You ought to photograph that and blow it up. Next slide. And that's exactly what he did. So this became almost a billboard side, size image. Now, if you're in the presence of this, um, uh, this piece, he called these projections, these black and white photographic blow-ups of the small collages. You feel as though these, these, these people, their streets, their eyes, their consciousness are projected out onto you. Instead of you looking at this piece as a viewer with the people in it being passive, it looks as though they are looking at perhaps even judging you. Um, these were the images and the works of art that turned Bearden's career. This gave him, gave him national acclaim, international acclaim, um, and really um, drove people to identify him as being an artist, not only of the moment, because his works had such immediacy, but an artist for all ages, because his work also had this kind of enduring quality this sense of composition and space and command of his medium and command of a narrative uh, within his medium. Um, next slide. Bearden stayed with um, projections just for a few years. Um, Conjure Woman is another very famous piece that he uh, create constructed during this period. And uh, he went on from the projections to do, um, to go into collage without photographing them. And so from here on in, I'm just gonna show you images just of women that he created, but I could show you images of women, of families, of nudes, of uh, domestic scenes. He had a number of beautiful themes that he wove of rituals, of baptism, he had a number of themes all representing black life that he would repeat over and over and over again, each time giving them new meaning. And I'm just gonna use these, these images of what I would call the powerful woman, the powerful black woman 
um, beginning with this Conjure woman from 1964. Next slide. She repeats in this image of Circe that he did as part of a series on the Odyssey. Next slide. Or the Corrines who reappear in his work that he would have experienced as a young man in the Ca Harlem cabarets. You can see their dancing in the right hand uh, 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 register. Next slide. And when he chooses to make a self portrait, he creates this, all of the components of, of visual image making that went into his collages, his work from the new, from the live model, uh, the works that he did in the 19, late 30s and early 1940s, the cutouts that he used for his collages. You may not be able to see it on your screen, but on that paper, he has a Benin mask the way he culled images from other cultures. He would use Benin masks. He would use um, uh, Persian um, uh, uh, artifacts. You can see behind his elbow a, uh, a 14th century Renaissance painting. He culled all of these images together in order to create this multiple layers of meaning that was, were able to convey um, the richness and density of African-American life and culture. Um, next, and I think this is my final slide. Um, I just wanna end by saying, um, I heard Sherman say that he was just the nicest person and he was just the nicest person. Uh, he was responsible, Bearden was responsible for my starting my career. Um, I met him when I was a graduate student at uh, Syracuse University and called him on the telephone on a payphone from the streets of New York and said, I'm looking for examples of your work and I can't find any at museums. Can I come visit you? And this man who's artist who had never met me before in his life said, yes. And that started um, a, um, a friendship between my husband, among my husband, Bearden, Nanette, that lasted uh, until the end of, of Romy's uh, life. And I always like to say that he was responsible for my coming to New York in the first place. After I met him and I curated a show of his in Syracuse, one day he called me and said, you know, they have a job over there at the Studio Museum in Harlem. I think you should go try out for it. And that started my career coming to New York City as um, the director of the Studio Museum. So I owe him a debt of gratitude, and I hope this book is one way of repaying that debt. Thank you. I think we're ready to have a conversation with Sherman and uh, June. Yeah. Yes, thank you questions. so much. <laughs> um, so the person you hear speaking right now is Sarah Holiday from the library staff, but I'm here with Miss Kelly uh, by a phone connection. My wife is sitting next to me and we were both really, really very happy that we were able to see that presentation that you just made. And, you know, we've, we've been dealing with Romy's work for some time. We know a lot about Romy and the material that you gave us. We just enjoyed it. it. It was very rich. It was very rich in a lot of information, but also very rich in the history. But what really struck me was the end of your presentation when you talked about calling Romy on the phone <laughs> and being invited to his house. Well, I don't want to take too long, but I think it's important because we love the, the fact that this happened. At that time, Essie Green Galleries, my wife Essie, who was my second wife, who died in the 2000. Mm, sorry. But we, were, we started a gallery in mm. Brooklyn, in Fort Green. And that's because we both were collecting and we were doing like Tupperware art parties. And then we decided, okay, let's actually do a gallery. So then at that time we were showing emerging artists, I guess that's a, I guess that's a contemporary artist of that time, but they were emerging artists. 
like Otto Neils for one and such. And we said, boy, we really would like to be able to show the masters like Romy Bearden. How, you know, how can we meet him? So I don't know if it was me or if it was, was Essie, but we said, let's look in the phone book, <laughs> which we did. We found his phone number. We called him. He answered mm -hmm. the phone. We had a very nice, very cordial and warm conversation and say, hope we get together at some time and meet one another. Well, my daughter at that time was going to school with a friend of hers whose mother was very much a socialite. <laughs> and her organization was doing a fundraiser and the fundraiser was based on Rome Wear Beard and Prince. So we, my Essie, myself, and my daughter went to that fundraiser and Romy was there. We introduced ourselves to him again and he was happy to see a young black family, my daughter and such in art. That began, began our relationship with Romy and Beard. After that, we became, in fact, after that, Romy became mm -hmm. our mentor. Mm -hmm. And through the years after, we really became very close, not only just an art, but very friendly with birthdays and holidays and such. But the, that beginning, so similar to yours, I guess it's probably characteristic of who yes. Romy Beard was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah, he's very open, very available. Very much so. It was amazing. I mean, you know, I'm a Buddhist, so I believe in karma. So that was really good karma for us. That was incredible karma. And as a result, in fact, it was with our meeting Romy, we he came to the gallery we had in, in Brooklyn and he saw what we were doing and he said, this is nice, but you have to really to exhibit the work of the masters. Now, at that time, we're talking about in the mid seventies, late seventies. Mm -hmm. he, he said, you have to really show the work of the masters. Well, the idea of a black master was not easy for black or anybody, not just black or for white, for anybody to, to really grasp as a reality, a black master. So that became our mission. That became our drumbeat. That became our, our life's career, actually. It was a veneration of black masters making our people aware that we indeed have black masters that go back to the 1800s. And that's what we've been doing since then. I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> How you became friends. Yeah, well, we'll talk about the dance company. That's what I was saying in the beginning. The um, as our mentor, Romy really made us aware of so many of the other artists that were both historic as well as contemporary for the time. And what was really interesting for me was how one of Romy's mentors was Charles Alston. It was, he was not only his mentor, he was actually his cousin by marriage. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And so we began to also co collect and seek the works of Charles Alston. Yeah. And then getting more involved in Charles Alston at that time, Charles had passed away, so we're dealing with the estate. And dealing with, uh, searching out with Charles Alston, discovered Alain Locke, mm -hmm. and that Alain Locke was so instrumental in his mantra of black artists going back to the root of their art. And how go to the same route as Picasso. Right. And 
that was such right. a motivation. What, what I thought was fascinating about, about Romy is that uh, over time, he, he really became a connoisseur almost of world art. He, he certainly, he would go to the Met and study the, you know, the Renaissance masters and study Eurocentric art. He became very good at, um, he, he would always say, I'm not a specialist in African art, but I can spot a good piece, tell a good piece from a, a bad one. So he, he made himself, uh, you know, really uh, conscious of what made for quality in African antiquities. Um, he became very knowledgeable about um, uh, Peruvian art, about uh, Persian miniatures. He, he just, there were a whole range of sort of cultural artifacts from all over the world, Japanese prints. Um, and and he, he really learned and understood uh, Chinese painting. He really learned these different vocabularies and then he used them quite skillfully. He brought all so, of them into his, his collage uh, developing to develop it. So we, Around the years, a few years before Romy passed away, you know, Nanette Bidden had mm -hmm. a dance company, and Romy Bidden suggested that I become mm -hmm. the chairman, and I and I did. And one of the concerts that we put on was to designate Romy Bidden as a Renaissance man. Because Romy was truly a Renaissance mm -hmm. man, he was very much a player mm -hmm. in all of the arts. You know, we know about his his music with sea breeze mm -hmm. and such, but in every aspect of it, Romy had that as part of his mm -hmm. his toolkit. But we earlier when we were talking before we really got on the air. I, we talked, I talked about his watercolor work because one of the things that I think is overlooked is Romy's mastery at, at watercolor. The watercolor and gouache in the beginning and how that work has been overshadowed by collage, mm -hmm. understandably, and how Romy returned to mm -hmm. watercolor the latter part of his life and he was doing watercolor as well as collage and i recall several incidents at Romy at, at, at their house and when it came to, to watercolor we were looking i can't recall exactly what it was what the work was but just the idea of watercolor as a medium for him he looked at this work and he was just making an offhand remark and said this is some of my best work. He really felt very strongly that watercolor was really some of his mm -hmm. best work. Mm -hmm. And I was really disappointed how this is not recognized in the marketplace, let's say, or even in, in uh, you know, in terms of museums and such. The watercolor is not as appreciated as I feel it deserves. Well, I, I think I think uh, I think Romy's whole body of work poses a real problem for museums, uh, watercolors and collage, because both are considered works on paper, right? And both are considered very fragile mediums. So artists who mm -hmm. work in watercolors or artists who work in collage. Um, in order to protect their work, can't have their work on view um, for a long period of time. So I'll give you an example. The mm -hmm. Metropolitan Museum of Art owns uh, uh, one of Bearden's greatest collages of uh, the block. You know, I don't mm -hmm. know, 18, 22 feet long and, uh, you know, six feet high. And it's just a magnificent piece. They can only exhibit that once every three or four years. And they can only exhibit it for three or four months at a time uh, because mm -hmm. uh, they have to keep it, you know, and they have to and they have to exhibit it behind UV glass uh, because it is it, it, it 
it would disintegrate otherwise. And so I think right. that um, watercolor, collage, uh, all, all, all the mediums that are works on paper, I, I think have that dis has a, as a disadvantage. And so I think they're always kind of, at, you know, in a way at, at a somewhat of, at a disadvantage from say oil painting. I can see that, but my critique is that it's not appreciated by mm. scholars. The art scholars. It's not appreciated by reviewers. It's not appreciated. Well, uh, mm. curators. It's you know, there's not the, the literature on his work in watercolor is mm. appalling, and that it's 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 mm. hard to find if you can find it mm. at all. And I, I wish that somehow there was a way to get more attention paid to his work in that medium by not necessarily museums in terms of their protection, but in by museums who recognize it's an over, overlooked body of work that in and of itself is really amazing, really worthy of the kind of literature that we get for mm -hmm. Picasso or, you know, I can name all the right. other people that we, we right. get books after books after book, Warhol, Warhol, right. Warhol. So, so it's an interesting co comment that's come through on the chat. It says, some Black artists took a cynical view of the Black artist's relationship to the mainstream art world, such as um, mm -hmm. Tom Lloyd. Did Bearden ever express a distinct view on this? I guess by this, you mean the relationship to mainstream or uh, one that might have developed or changed over time. I, mm -hmm. I think, I think that, that Bearden's experience with Korea was his awakening about how dispensable an artist can be Mm. With these would be the mainstream. I mean, he wasn't when he was in, with the Coots Gallery. He was part of the mainstream, right? That was a major yeah. gallery. Ooh, he was selling cool. works. He was getting attention from the press and the critics. And um, when Coots mm -hmm. dropped him, it's like he dropped off the dropped off the planet. Mm. And I, I thought it was interesting that he. In my own personal view, and, and I would love to hear June, if June Kelly is with us, I'd love to hear what June's thoughts are about this. I, I think uh, Bearden ultimately came to the point, and he was, he was over 50 when he came to this point, so it took him a while to get there. I think he came to the point of, I am going to make the art that's, that I need to make, right? Mm. It's great yes. if the mainstream buys it, and too bad if they don't. But this is the art, this is the artwork I need to make. And he, here's the infrastructure of support that I need in order to make it. I, I, that's how, that's what I think. In my view, that's what I think he came to. I agree with you. I agree with you very much. And I, and I, huh? yeah. I wonder, because I also, okay. what, what do I do? I also, I wish it was, it was different, but when I look at the ascendancy today of black art, and I look at the artists whose work is now really just escalating to phenomenal prices, okay. very unexpected things that we never expected would, would happen. That's good. But, uh, but Romain's work, the prices of his work have not grown to the degree that many others have, and I, I, I don't understand it. I don't know why, and I, 
and I, you know, to me, the idea that contemporary art would displace Rome, the work of Romeo Bearden, it's hard for me, hard for me to digest, hard for me to accept. I, I think we I think Bearden's work is challenging. I, I don't think it's easy. And I don't think it's easy work to read, to be with, to live with. Um, I think he makes, you know, it, 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 it's complicated work. It's, it's work. <laughs> True. There's, there's another interesting question um, in the chat. Um, um, I may just jump in for a moment. We do have Miss Kelly on the line here. Oh. Miss Kelly, if you'd like yes. to speak to the Go previous ahead. question or okay. anything sure. else. Sure. June is on the line. June is on the line. Uh-huh. Hello, June. Listening to two of you, Mary as well as Chairman, I think that you have put together a composite of Bearden and his life uh, very well. I think so. I call Romy a man of all seasons. Romy was the kind of person, as, as an artist, though, I would say, the word global that we hear today, he was already there looking at the world, looking at diversity, looking at the way people are going to respond to his art and to all art. And I think at that particular point, we have a genius working within the scope. And as Mary has put it together very eloquently, that Romeo Bearden is a giant among the artists of today. It is. I met I must say, I worked with him for 10 years. I met him through Herbert Gentry, and he was having a show in Paris at Albert Lowe Gallery. He needed someone to go there to work on the procedures and putting the show together and so forth and, and all the PR that was needed, and I did that. And then I, when I came back, he asked me what I was going to do, but I was already working with artists from my home. And then I came on board to work with Bearded with the Cordia and Ekstrom Gallery. It was a triumphant situation. He was, he was a genius. He understood people. He was a great storyteller. And Mary, you most likely know this very well, too, that he was the greatest. He interjected so many things and brought things together and people together mm -hmm. by his thoughts and so forth. But the art itself today, when we look at it, is triumphant, I must say. Um, Sherman mentioned that his art, in terms of gaining the kind of, well, I would say the kind of attention, but he is slowly getting there, Sherman. And uh, I think that people are beginning to recognize the importance of him. And and Romy was that kind of a person. He was never pushy, but he was always knowing just how good he was and, and what he was bringing to the public at large and how important the art that he was putting together searched and gave to every human being a feeling of who you are and what you are about and how important this art is to you. He, do, he made you think, and this is the crowning part of Romeo Beard as a genius. I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I'm happy to hear that you feel that things are getting better. And I certainly hope so, and I certainly will pray that that's true. But it's, it's still- so Mary, I'd like to hear your well, I, I, you know, June, I, 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 I love the fact that that things are getting better for him on the art market. I have to say, I'm, I'm not one who follows the art market, but I am one who does follow um, Bearden as an intellectual uh, leader. And I'm reading in the, and I, I say this in preface to, I'm reading in the chat. Um, it says one of my favorite Bearden artworks is the 1977 collage, The Return of Odysseus. If I remember correctly, the intention was to show a link between the struggles of Odysseus and those of African-Americans. Were there similar artworks that link literature and art with political and social discourse? That is the 
That's the kind of question that people like Fred Moten, who just won the MacArthur Genius Award, is asking. Mm -hmm. And he is saying things like, you look at, when you think of African-Americans, you, you think of the fact that for so many decades post-emancipation, we've had this sort of um, a condition of homelessness. And that uh, the, uh, the uh, Odyssey series that Bearden did as collages, he did it as, as prints, he did them as watercolors, he did them in so many wonderful versions of that. But he captures that, that struggle to find your way to a home to a place of belonging, which, and, and, and so he was, his paintings contain intellectual ideas, you know, ideas that poets, scholars, musicians can grab hold of. And the great thing that I love, June, about his work is that when, they, when, when, when um, we celebrated his, the centennial of his birth in 2011, the Studio Museum did a show and they invited all these artists, you know, if you were influenced by Rome Reed Bearden, you know, show me your work that influenced him. All, all of the leading, all of the leading black artists of the day have been profoundly influenced by Rome Reed Bearden. Every single one of them. Carl Walker, <laughs> Carrie James Marshall, Hank Willis Thomas, Wangechi Mutu, you name it. So he has tremendous influence. He touches poets, scholars, musicians, all kinds. So when you see that happening, you know that his art is going to live, right? Because it lives through other creative people. And I agree with you, June, that, that it's a, just a matter of time when the prices will catch up with it. You know, I, I, I think it takes people to, some time to understand how important this artist's work is, you know? So I, I'm ultimately optimistic. Definitely, but I think the the key thing here is that Romy Bearden laid, as you said, laid the foundation for all of these artists to reflect, look back, and understand where he was coming from and where you are going as well, and the road that you're going to be taking. And that's what he laid there. And so people are beginning to really understand that to a certain degree. And I think the road is going to open wider, but at the same time, the platform that he left for the younger artists to come today to understand globally, internationally, and to understand your position in this world as an artist, Roman of Yerton laid the foundation. Yeah. I'm also seeing younger people are showing a greater interest in Romy's work sooner. And when I say sooner, what I mean is early on when we were trying to really sell Bearden's work, we had a lot of resistance because people would look at it and say, oh, these are cutouts. But younger people today ac accept that kind of work, accept that technique and embrace the work a lot quicker than it was embraced one-on-one, -on -one, for us anyway, earlier. So I'm encouraged by that very much. I think, as you've both been saying, it is a matter of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Question for me is, do I have the time? <laughs> <laughs> if I might pitch in a question, um, one of the things that fascinated me about learning about Bearden was his involvement in lots of art forms. I mean, obviously several visual forms, different media, but also as a, a composer and or lyricist. Um, and it seems like there must be inspiration there for all kinds of artists. Do you find that young people today, I mean, Dr. Campbell, you're in an uh, educational setting, um, are kind of crossing artistic boundaries between types of art as well as between media and genre? Uh, 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 the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> but I, I, I think the answer as it relates to Bearden is that uh, one of the fascinating things that um, 
was really uh, made clear when I sat down to write the book was the extent to which Bearden was so curious about other artists' art form. So, so it so happens that when I came to spell, the year I came to spell and it was 2015, Diane McIntyre was artist in residence here. Now it turns out that she collaborated with Bearden years earlier. And I had a chance to sit down and talk to Diane about what that collaboration was like. And she said he would come to her dance studio, sit down and just watch the way they put dance together, the way they choreographed it, the way they talked to each other. the way, And then he would just watch them dance and he would just watch that, she said, um, as a prelude to the work that he did uh, for um, designing what turned out to be the sets and costumes for uh, the concert. Um, you know, he worked with uh, Derek Walcott. Um, he worked with the poet Samuel Allen. Um, um, uh, Jeanette uh, Sanger was talking about those watercolors that he did for the John Cassavetes film, Gloria. Um, he was invited to uh, create those watercolors for the opening credits of that film. So, so I mean, he worked with so many different, Max Roach is another artist he worked. He worked with so many different artists, poets, dancers, choreographers, um, filmmakers that, you, you know, he, he just had this incredible curiosity. And again, it is kind of a prelude to what we see now among young artists who feel that they don't have to stay within any, within any boundaries of a medium. They can cross easily cross those boundaries or combine them in ways that are creative. Romy was doing that years ago. Seems like a wonderful of the range of Bearden's work in terms of dance. I mean, it was monumental when you went to see those creations. Mm -hmm. And Bearden sat there and he pulled it together, came home and drew and found his voice within the dance mm -hmm. pieces. So I would think that when you think again, when you come back to Romeo Bearden, you're not looking at a one dimensional person, you're looking at a creator of many talents, of many thoughts and cre and ideas, and a, a artist who today is one of the top artists of America. Yes. As well as, okay, I would say, and Europe as well. I mean, you have to really sit down and think about this person. This is a mind that has been created, that he created. He never overlooked any person that he talked to. He took all of that information mm -hmm. and gathered it into his work. Mm -hmm. And he became this surmountable creator and artist of today. Yeah, I, I remember being in, a, this is a, I mean, this is a funny story to me. I remember being in a car <clears throat> with Romy um, and, and Romy had Frank Stewart uh, very often drove Romy from one place to the next because Romy didn't drive. <laughs> so I remember being in a car and, and Romy had his elbow on the window and he we had stopped for a red light and he looked out the window and he was looking on a green grocer, right? And there were oranges and tomatoes and lemons and limes. That's what I saw. Romy looked out and he said, oh, look at those colors, the yellows and the orange and, and oh, look at the texture. He, he, he could see more than most people. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I look out and I see a bunch of, you know, fruits on a fruit stand. He sees this beautiful combination, this choral uh, uh, moment of colors uh, on, the, on the street corner. Um, so, so it was really quite wonderful to get these glimpses of the way he saw the world. And I, I remember a, I was interviewing an artist who was a, um, who would go and visit him on Saturdays um, to watch the basketball game. And he said 
he remembers sitting watching the basketball game and you know they're all you know rooting for their different teams and he said Romy would be saying oh look at the way he arcs up towards that shot or look at the lines you know it's almost like he he actually saw the world um the he was able to abstract the beauty of the world <laughs> Computers, and there's another aspect, and that is the uh, St. Martin work that he did, and how he incorporated the folkways and mores of that particular area and brought it to light so that others could see it and the beauty of it. And he got into the relationship of, the, of his work and St. Martin's in, indigenous climate yeah. and brought it to life and made it swell and the colors became enigmatic and you saw Romy appearing again thinking looking at it and understanding and appreciating the people of that region mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that the St. Martin for one of the things about Romy that I it's very distinct is you can see the growth in his work during his life his work changed in cycles as his life cycle changed his work changed and the St. Martin's work is incredibly yeah. beautiful and Romy did say specifically about that work that he really felt that was his best and when after Rumi passed away in the Sturry Museum had the exhibition of his work uh, it was not that long after Romy had passed and and man was was not enthusiastic about going she was resistant so the next to the last day, I was able to get her to come to the Stewardy Museum and to see the exhibit. And she was on the way out, she tried to to reach out and touch Romy's photograph. And on the way home, back down to Canal Street, she didn't speak. So I didn't speak. And we drove silently, silently back down to Canal Street. And then just as I was leaving and going, getting ready to go back, she said, you got to get Eddie to see this show. Eddie was a cousin of Romy's that wasn't a blood cousin. You know, it's the kind of cousin we black people have, you know, he's a cousin. And Eddie was a very brilliant man but on his own. So I got Eddie to come down. And as we go through the show, Eddie's remarking, and one of the things he said was, look, going from the beginning of his work, going towards the end of his life, towards the St. Martin's body of work, beginning, he says, you can see how angry Romy was. So after, after the war, after his time in the army, he says, Romy was enraged. He was angry. And then you can you move along to different stages, and he says, it's, you can see he's beginning to come out of it. And he, he said, you can see he's becoming less and less angry. And then when we got to the end, when his work was more colorful, brighter, more of just engaging, he said, and now he's mm -hmm. free. I said, whoa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never realized that mm -hmm. until that moment. Mm -hmm. and, that, and now when I look at his body of work, yeah. I can see that. And, 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 you know, if you read the correspondence, uh, he, he, had a, he had years of correspondence between Romy and um, Carl Holty, um, and, mm -hmm. and also with Barry Stavis, who became also, who was another friend of uh, Romy's. And then towards the end of his life, Herb Gentry. And that's 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 really the best. 
Um, but but um, you can see that that anger is 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 on is is front stage, front and center. Um, enraged at the way he was treated by Coots, um, he felt that um, he was not his work really wasn't understood. Um, enraged by the way the world considered or try to pigeonhole and box black artists in and label them and then write them off. Um, and uh, his early collages, those projections, the faces in those projections, those are angry faces. Angry, angry. <laughs> you're in a room of projections and you're, oh my gosh. Coming at me. You know, but they're really, and you can see that over time, you can see the the ability to, you know, as you say, liberate himself. So when he gets to the Odyssey and that voyage, that sense of going away and coming back, you know, and all the battles in between, I think that was kind of one of those pivotal moments and, and certainly going to, to St. Martin's, finding that place. That place where he could leave the literally leave the country, go up on his you know to his studio, and look out at the world and and be an artist, the artist, whatever artist he wanted to. Be. Sure, yeah, that that, sure. that 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 there, there is that 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 moment of, of of you can feel it in the work as the work just becomes more open and and luscious actually in the process. <laughs> Mary, I think that we should take Charlotte, North Carolina. No room here and put it on the map. It is a local place to live, to understand the more ways and properties of that particular county. Mm -hmm. And he brought people to life so that we could see them as they go along and how important they were to the humankind mm -hmm. and then the development. And so you have a place that Romeo Theater pictured, but took it and made it a nation. Mm -hmm. And that is what Charlotte, North Carolina became to the world. Mm -hmm. The people that he really saw, that he loved, that he created. Mm -hmm. That's that very was. true. Have you seen the park they built in his honor in Charlotte? Yeah, it's so beautiful. It is so beautiful. It's an incredible tribute. I, I don't think I've seen a tribute quite as beautiful to an artist. <laughs> but but it's so humankind what he's done with with Charlotte. Yeah, you know, yeah. they are people. They have joys and sorrows and births and so forth. And he made them become a community that people can look at and understand and look beyond yourself and see how important it is to be in a world where you can actually connect. And he made this a sounding kind of view that who we are as people, how do we become this? And how do we filter and understand each other? And he made Charlotte this important place mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. Very true, very true. It's beautiful. Um, so we have one comment here to which I was going to append one more little thing. Um, someone mentions that they've inherited a small collage called the Melon Eater. Um, don't know if that rings a bell to anybody present and if you might be able to offer some context on that work of Bearden's. But I was also going to throw in for those of us who may not be uh, tremendously knowledgeable on his work yet, where do we go to seek out a beginner item. I mean, should we go to the Met? Should we go to one of your galleries? June, I'll let you know because I've not been in New York for a long time. <laughs> so I don't know what's hanging. <laughs> what's the work that they have again? What work are we talking um, about? The one that the uh, attendee asked about is called the Melon Eater. It's a person who's beginning, where do they begin to see this work? Oh, I think for the uh, beginner, the first thing you do is start to read about Romeo Bearden. Okay, you don't go to a, even whether June Kelly Gallery or any other. I mean, you just don't go to buy. You get 
seek into who he is, learn more about him, do as much reading as you can, and then you step out. And then you talk to different people and find out where his works are. So that, and you can go to the museums, you can go to um, D.C. Moore Gallery, you can go to Sherman. Um, these are, you know, and these are the places where you start to learn more about Romeo Bearden. And as I say, the most important thing is to read. To get steeped into who he is, to know when you can go to a gallery, you can talk about the word. You know who you're talking about, the person that is in your mind. And this is very important to you as a, as a buyer. Know the art that you are buying. Know what it means and the importance of it. You know, it's something that goes with you as you, as you travel along to buy other art. And this is very important. You just don't buy a piece of art. You get into the art and to the artist and you learn as much as you can Penny just made a very good, Penny, my wife, just made a very good suggestion, and that is go to the foundation. Deidre Harris Kelly has impressed me with how much she knows about Bearden. And she certainly is a good start because she and Robert O'Mealy, they're very close. And I think that that's a good jumping off point is the Bearden Foundation. Deidre Hound and Paris Kelly, and I think from there on, you'll, you'll get some good direction. And O'Mealy at Columbia University. Yeah, yeah Bob O'Mealy in Columbia, very close to Deidre. So I would start there. You can also read I start there myself. You could also deeply. read my book. Well, no, I'm going to put the link. Book is great. I, I thought we would. I thought we started out because there was a particular work that someone wanted to know something about. The melon. Or did I have that wrong? No, she said the melon. Well, I think that Mary's book is the beginning. It is this thorough documentation of Romy's life, and I think that from begins yes. you know the artist first, and she has done a great job with that. So that's where I would start. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I think we might draw to a close there, but I'm happy to have any of the presenters add anything else that you'd like to toss in or anything else that's been raised by the conversation and on behalf of the library. Thank you so much. This has been marvelous. Anything thank else? you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, thank I, you, Sherman. Worked. Thank you, June. Thank all of you and thanks for oh, Barbara. I'm, I really enjoyed having this opportunity to talk with you guys.